Welcome, welcome. I'm so excited to be here with one of our amazing writers, contributors, Tanasa Sunni, who is going to be showing us how to make um, a traditional Persian stew tonight. I know that you guys are going to have a lot of questions. So if you haven't done this with us before, I'm just going to ask for you to try and hold some of your questions until the last 15 minutes. She knows what questions you're going to ask, or at least a lot of them, and she will help answer them throughout. Um, and we will allow for questions at the end. So please just try and be patient. I will share the recipe once again in the chat so you have it. And also to Naz's Instagram account so you can go and follow along with all of the beautiful things that she cooks. Um, let me share a little background about her. She was born in Tehran to a Jewish family and she's based in Los Angeles. She's written for Lucky Peach, Thrillist, The Mashup Americans, and Shofar, and The Nosher, of course. Uh, she is interested in exploring Los Angeles' global culinary landscape, a very delicious one, um, and interviewing moms and grandmas from Iran for a regional Iranian Jewish cookbook. Her Instagram account is at Tanez Sassouni. You should definitely go follow along with her and look for so many of the wonderful pieces that she's written for us on The Nosher. Um, and without further ado, I will, sh I will shut up and hand this over to her. A reminder to uh, please be respectful of both Tanaz and your fellow participants. The chat is open, but let's try and hold our questions until the end if we possibly can. All right, I am shutting up. Tanaz, please take it away. Hello, thank you all so much for uh, joining us today. This is so fun. I will mention as a disclaimer first, I am based in Los Angeles, but I am in Vancouver in a friend's kitchen right now. And after this, um, after this demo, we are getting on a flight tonight to go to France. I'm using an Instant Pot for the first time. So bear with me, things are a little crazy, but uh, I'm really excited about it. So as um, Shannon, thank you so much, Shannon, mentioned, I am Iranian Jewish and we're making a dish tonight that is, it's a classic Iranian dish. It's called Khurish Tabih. It's a stew that's made from quince, which is this guy right here, um, and beef and other delicious sweet and sour ingredients. Um, and it is frequently had as a like pre-fast meal for Yom Kippur by Iranian Jews. I wanna jump into it so that we can get going and then we'll talk about the dish and me and Iranian Jewish food once we do. So I, so basically the dish in, in short steps is like you fry your quince, you fry your meat or like brown your meat and onions and other ingredients, and then you stew everything together. I have taken the liberty to fry the quince already. If that gives you an idea of like how brown do you want it? Um, so let's get to the meat. Like I said, First time using an Instant Pot, bear with me, but um, I do have the pot on a second camera. Um, so I think that, um, okay, we're sauteing. I've spotlighted both Tanaz and her pot. So if you are not seeing it, you just swipe over and you should see it on the next screen. But hopefully you're, you're, you're seeing both so you can watch her cook and her lovely face all at the same time. Thank you. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do is start with the, um, with the onions, get those in the pan or pot. And you can do this with not an instant pot. You can do this with a regular pressure cooker. It just takes a lot longer if you're using a regular pot. Um, okay, today we're doing it this way. And I will say that like my mom does it this way, therefore it's legit to do it in the pressure cooker. So we're gonna add in, I had a half an onion diced there. Um, and I have a half a pound of beef shank that I have, oh, I can actually fit under this camera, look at that, um, that I have removed most of its fat and I've chopped it into chunks and uh, I salted it, you know, with kosher meat, part of the process of like cost sharing wheat is, is salting it. So like, since this is not kosher meat, that way you make sure that you have enough salt in your dish by salting it ahead of time. So I'm gonna drop that in. And then lastly, I'll talk about oh and some turmeric. I don't know if you guys are familiar with turmeric. It is a, it's like a root that has a really bright yellowy orange color. Its flavor is kind of like an earthy flavor, and um, it's used in a ton of Persian dishes. It's supposed to have some great like anti-inflammatory properties and other really good properties. So like, use it in your dishes. I've heard that 
in Indian cooking, you kind of, when you, when you add black pepper to turmeric, that combination like activates the good stuff. We're using salt and pepper anyway, so we're doing it right. In addition to being helpful, it will be delicious. It'll be well seasoned. Um, and what else? Salt. Salt is here. And I've already salted the meat, so I'm just adding a little bit more for the onions. And then I'm going to add, I'm going to stir this through, and then I'm going to add one more ingredient that I'll talk to you guys about. I go in. So right now you're using like the browning setting, right? I, oh yeah, I have it on the saute setting. Um, I think that's okay. the one for the browning um, setting, the saute setting. Saute setting. You can tell I, I I don't use an instant pot. I'm like, the <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> um, and then the last ingredient that we're gonna throw in there right now is these guys. Um, I can bring it up to the camera. It's called in Persian. It's called alu bukhara. Alu is plum, and bukhara means it's like bukhara, and I guess that's probably where it comes from. They're these like golden orange plums. They're really slap sour. They're very very delicious, and they're like. As we cook, I'll keep telling you, but like um, in Persian food, let me jump in and then we'll talk about their properties. What they do is um, they they help to balance out the sweet and sour. So hold on. rinse off that stickiness. Um, but yeah, those those plums, alu bukhara, they like I said, they're very sour, and a lot of times in Persian food. We like to use fruit um, in savory dishes, and this is an extremely good example of that. We have the quince, we have the pomegranate juice, and then we also have the aloo. You can use dried apricots as well, but like it's a constant game of balancing sweet and sour, sweet and sour. Um, let me stir this through, and then we'll talk about it. I think we're doing great here with this instant pot. I can see the steam coming off of it, so it's it's, it's really it's, cooking. It actually yeah. works. This thing. That's great. Who the fuck? Um, I see a lot of um, I see a lot of questions, guys. I just want to tell you, we're gonna answer them. Tanaz just wants to get the dish going, and then we'll answer the questions. We're we're getting there, okay? Yeah. Okay. So I can tell you more about those. So they are they are kind of dried plum. I wouldn't substitute prunes for them, but you could substitute dried apricots. I asked my mom about that one and she was like, no, prunes will mess up the look of the dish because they're so dark. So you can use dried apricots. But um, if you can maybe find them at a Middle Eastern, uh, Middle Eastern market, depending on where in the country you are and how well stocked your Middle Eastern market is. Um, so yeah, so what we're making now, it's called the cholisht. It's kind of a class of Persian dishes that are stews that are eaten over rice. Um, so I actually have some rice and wine. We'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, uh, some of them are kind of green in color and they are based in like herbs or celery, spinach, things like that, and are also on the sour side. Persians love sour food. Um, but the fruit ones like the, um, are are usually like a red orange color and they uh, they have that balance of sweet and sour. Let me give this another stir and then I'll answer some questions. I know you guys have a bunch. I muted myself. Um, if you can't find quince um, or you're nervous about using quince, what what would you use instead of quince? Um, that is a great question. You can use apples. Um, it, it won't be quite the same, and I'll talk about quince, but it'll be really good. I My one tip is don't use Granny Smith. Use a, a sweet apple. Um, you can use like any of the like Gala, Fuji, Honeycrisp, or like Golden Delicious. That works as well. Um, and yeah, again, it, it comes down to just tasting it as you go and deciding if it needs to be sweeter, if it needs to be more sour. Um, but to tell you, this is a quince. I'll bring it up to the camera. It's kind of apple-esque, but it's um, a lot harder. When it's raw, it's a lot starchier. And it, when it's raw, it's not as sweet. But when you cook it, 
it gets really soft and really jammy. It takes on a darker color, like kind of like a, almost like the color of the pomegranate juice, like an orangey pink color. Um, and it gets really sweet. So it's really delicious. Um, uh, a couple of other questions that were in there. How many does this serve? It serves about four. Uh, it'll often be at a Persian meal with a family. It'll be on a table with a million other things. So like there might be a roasted chicken, there might be another rice dish, there might be another quidditch. Um, but yeah, I think this serving will serve about four. Oh, somebody's asking how I cut and prep the quince. All I did was I cut it in half, I cored it, and then I sliced it. So it's just like wedges like that. And they're pretty thin, I'd say, even thinner than half an inch, half an inch or less. Yeah. Um, how do I know when a quince is ripe? Usually when they're in the store, they're in season because they're not there often. So. Ah, so we can talk about this. Actually, let's check on this and see how we're doing. Maybe we'll get the spoon going. I'm going to give it like another minute or two. What you're after is... What you're looking for is full browning on your meat and a little bit of... Um, a little bit of beginning to caramelize of your onion. So we'll give it a couple minutes to get the onions going. Um, what else? Somebody's asking if it can be cooked in an old-fashioned old pressure cooker. Absolutely. In an oven, I don't know. I bet you could do it, but I don't know the directions. Um, well, if you're cooking it like in a slow cooker or an oven, would it would it still cook like at a like a like a low and slow temperature for several hours? Yeah, I think you could do it. It's all about like it's just a stew at the end of the day. So like, yeah, the details of it aren't that specific as long as everything cooks through and cooks together for a while. Um, pears instead of quince, somebody is asking. I don't know. I haven't tried it. My fear would be that they kind of fall apart, but I don't yeah. know. I think pears are, are have, you know, they don't hold their, their shape the way that yeah, an apple that would. that would be my would concern. Um, um, can you talk through one more time? Because I think quince is not a, um, an ingredient many um, Ashkenazi Jews are familiar with. Um, preparing. So when you buy it, you know, are you peeling it? What are you looking for? Talk us you. through the whole process. Away the knife. I'm not going to show you. But yeah, you don't peel. You don't need to peel it for this dish. Um, it can be eaten raw. Even I don't like it. I feel like it has kind of a starchy raw potato texture when you eat it raw. But like my sister is a fan. Some people like it. Um, but yeah, I, I think maybe the most common preparation or the most familiar preparation is that like in Spain they make a quince paste called yes. mandillo which like sometimes you'll have on a cheese plate or something like that we do that as well actually like my family will make quince preserves at this time of year and then they will take those preserves blend them down and set them into a paste like that and have little squares of it and have it as a Passover sweet um, it's called lozabe and it's really delicious um, so yeah, so it can be used in sweet preparations. In this case, we're using it in savory, uh, but it will still, it'll give sweetness to the dish. Um, quince jam. I think you want the big chunks for this dish. Uh, if you're using an apple, yeah, I would peel an apple. Um, what else? Somebody was asking about chicken instead of beef. I, you probably could, you might want to stew like actually bone in pieces of chicken and serve it. It's a totally different dish, but you could do it. You can also use turkey thigh if you don't want to use beef. Um, what else? What else do you guys want to know? I, I'm just going to, I'm going to plug my, my, my constant comment, everybody, which is like, look, we're here. We're learning this dish tonight. Okay. So, so we can, rem we can try to hold in all of our substitution questions. This is, this is made with beef. If you don't like this recipe, you don't have to make it. So I, I'm, I'm personally interested in hearing from Tanaz about this dish. So let's just, let's just try to hold in our, our substitution questions. They can get very distracting. Okay. That's my, my plug. Please don't make me ask 17 times in the next 40 minutes. Okay. okay. I think we're ready to go on to the next stage. So what I'm going to do is first add in some tomato paste. I think I said three tablespoons. Um, and I like to like give it a minute with the tomato paste to like, it seems strange, but like fry the tomato paste even just for a minute before throwing in all the liquid. So here's a one, two, three. 
And I'll stir that in. Tanaz, who taught you to make this dish? Pardon? Who taught you how to make this dish? My mom. Um, all of my recipes. That's not true. What I what I like to do is talk to women from other from different cities in Iran who are Jewish. Um, oh, is it six tablespoons tomato paste? Thank you. Um, I'll add more and find out their recipes. And it turns out that every city has different specific recipes. I've learned a great deal. And a lot of it is stuff that you won't find in a restaurant. It's only things that you'll find in that in a um, household. So I, you know, it's things that I had never heard of before. Um, this is a more common dish, but yeah, but definitely like the dishes that I feel most comfortable sharing are the ones from my own family because I grew up eating them and I know exactly how they should go. And this is definitely one of them. I like, I have a sense of what is to be because I've been eating it all my life. So yeah, let's throw this stuff in. Oh yeah, we're getting some things in there. I'll throw in more tomato paste because somebody is fortunately keeping me honest here. And I will say in that sweet and sour balance, tomato paste is also a source of sour. It's a source of acid. So keep that in mind. So we're doing three cups of water, two and one. Oh, it's smelling good in here. And let's toss that through. And then we're gonna add a cup of um, pomegranate juice. This is about 11 ounces, so it's about two thirds of this guy. And also remember that like when these dishes were developed, no one had measuring cups. So you can fudge these things and taste it. And that's how you should figure out how to do mm. it. Um, so. It's hard, these family dishes sometimes, you know, my, my husband has a lot of wonderful dishes from his grandmother. Mm -hmm. And as I've tried to document them, I'll say, well, how much is it? And he's like, I don't know. I have to see it. I have to feel it. Yep. Right. That is the whole game. <laughs> that is how it goes when I'm trying to like figure out recipes from somebody else of like my mom or my aunts or whoever else of like, but how much? And they're like, well, you know, en enough until it's done. <laughs> so the right amount, the right amount, obviously. Um, okay. And then We'll throw in the quince, and then that's like the majority of our cooking. And then we can talk. And then we'll plate. What so, else is what else is typically served in your family before uh, Yom Kippur as part of the meal? Let me tell you. Let's get this going, and then we'll. Sorry, sorry, I can't. On, I'll, I'll hold back my own questions. No, no, that's a great question, and I want to talk about it, but. The instant pot is the, the biggest variable in this whole process and the most potentially dangerous too. Um, Saves the day. It sure does more than once, always. Okay, so I'm gonna turn this up to pressure cook. Uh, so cancel, cancel, cancel. Jess, you want to save the day again? I don't know how to use this thing either. Okay, we're gonna be oh, it's still on it's like stuck on such day and trying to get it. Oh wait, here we go. So we'll go up to pressure cook, hit start, hit start. Okay, and so we're gonna let's go in. We're gonna let that go for 20 minutes. Um, and yeah, let's talk about um, pre-fast in an Iranian Jewish home. I'll mention that um, my family, we my mom typically does not make this dish for the pre-fast meal, um, but I am going to lobby for it for the future because she usually makes like, uh, it's kind of basically just like chicken broth with chicken um, and chickpeas over rice, but she intentionally makes it bland because she's like, you guys are going to get thirsty. I don't want you to get thirsty. But I like, I think, so this dish um, has a lot of 
things going for it. Um, oh, you need to close the spout. I need to push the button. What do push I need? The, the release. Yeah. But I think that releases it, doesn't it? Mm. This thing. How do I close it? Oh, I had it. I think it was okay before. This is creepy thing. I think it's okay. I think we're all right. And then that's gonna pop up as it as it pressurizes. Fingers crossed that this thing's cooked this thing cooks, guys. <laughs> um we need we should get Jeffrey Eisner on the phone. Uh he taught it, he's the instant pot um guru. <laughs> that would be great. Um next time we'll have to do that. <laughs> the black knob on top should be turned to the right. I think I did. I think we're okay. Maybe. I don't know, it's just spinning. It says it's on, it says it's preheating. I think we're good. We'll see, we'll see, it'll be fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, to answer the question, this particular dish, uh, part of the reason that it is perfect for this moment is that it is perfectly in season. Like quince is kind of a beginning of fall uh, fruit. The pomegranate is also a beginning of fall. The, the alu, the dried plums give it like that end of summer piece as well. So it just fits right, just right into that sweet spot. Um, and I think that the, the sourness makes it addictive. Like I feel like when something is too sweet, you don't want to eat a lot of it because it can be cloying. But when it has that sourness, you just want to eat more and more and more. And I think it does make you thirsty. So it makes you drink a lot of water. Um, so in that respect, I feel like, well, this is a perfect pre-fast meal. It's like fill up and it gets you to drink water. And then the last, my, like, this is a personal hypothesis, but, um, maybe you guys know that, um, uh, Sephardic Jews and also some other like Mizrahi and Middle Eastern Jews at their Rosh Hashanah dinner, there's basically like a set of symbolic foods called simanim that, um, you eat and you say a blessing over and blah, 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 almost like a Seder, like we have for Passover. And pomegranate is one of those foods. So I wonder if it's like, oh, we have these pomegranates that we opened up and seeded for Roshana, um, that we didn't eat all of them. We have these leftovers. It might be time, like they're gonna go. So it might be time to um, cook them up. I think this is working. I feel good about this. Um, so yeah, that's, those are kind of my hypotheses about why this dish has become a pretty fast Yom Kippur meal. Um, somebody's asking what we eat to break. Oh, and then the other things we'll have at that time are like watermelon again, so you don't get thirsty and tea because everyone is addicted to caffeine. And so you got to get in your last hit before the fast. Um, and then somebody's asking about what we, um, what we break the fast with. And that is very specific, actually. Um, the, the dinner that we have, we used to have like a big Persian dinner. My mom would make all this food while she was fasting. My mom is a very dutiful Jewish mother and wife. She, I was born on Yom Kippur <laughs> and she fasted the day that I was born. So that gives you an idea of her sense of obligation to her familial duties. Um, but yeah, so she would make these big dinners and my sister and I would be like, you know, you, you're hungry, but you also kind of feel weird and it's too much food and it's too much work for her. So we actually break our fast. Like the dinner that we have now is bagels. Like we, we have adopted <laughs> the traditions of the Ashkenazis um, of, around us in America. But um, we do have three very specific things to break the fast first. One is a, it's kind of between a beverage and a, um, and kind of like a dessert or a snack. It's called fadu de sim. What you do is you grate apples, more apples, again, tis the season. Um, you grate apples and then you add sugar and rose water and water and you chill it and then you have it over ice so you can kind of sip the um sip the, the rose watery sweet fragrant liquid and eat the apples with a spoon and it is perfect because one you can prepare it ahead two you're thirsty and it's like immediately quenching your thirst and it's cool and refreshing uh and three i feel uh, and the sweet kind of gives you a hit of energy from the sugar and the apples but then the rose water like that fragrance uh, really kind of wakes you up. And oh yeah, and there's the recipe that I wrote for the nosher uh, last year around this time. 
uh, or I guess two years ago around this time. But uh, yeah, so that is like, it is a, it is the perfect way to break the fast. So we do that as soon as we get home and then uh, soft boiled eggs because they're fast. And again, they're kind of cozy and give you immediate protein uh, and a cup of tea because we all have headaches because we're all addicted to caffeine. And then we have dinner after that. So that's the, um, that is the breakfast meal that we have. Um, I've heard of other, like another, an Esfahani woman who I kind of interviewed for this project who unfortunately we lost a couple of years ago. She, in her family, instead of Faladisid, they make um, like a, a beverage that uses, in Persian it's called um, which means seeds used for beverages, basically. Seeds used for a shaibat, which is like a sweet beverage. I, I've heard it's chia seeds, I've heard it's basil seeds, but again, it's like rose water, water, sugar, and then these seeds, and then you just stir it. And that actually takes on a little bit of a kind of viscous property, but again, it's the same concept of like something sugary and cold um, and fragrant to really wake you up and, and break you out of your fast. Um, yeah, so that's the breakfast meal. Uh, we have some time now. I feel like it was go, go, go in the beginning, but now I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have. So you're, so, you know, Ashkenazi Jews in America will have this like sort of traditional American breakfast as their breakfast with, you know, kugel or blintzes or oh, yeah. bagels. So yours is like, you, I love this. I love the tradition of the apple rose water. Um, it sounds so refreshing. And then you sit down and you have like a real dinner after that. That's correct. We used to. Now we have bagels. Uh, we, Kugel and blintzes are a step too far into the exotic, I think, for my family. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone in my family has ever made either of those things. Like we've had Kugel and blintzes usually like at like the Oneg after Shabbat services at like somebody's bar mitzvah or something, but it's not something that has really made it into our home. But yeah, we, we used to have like a big like rice dishes and roasted chicken or fish or whatever. Um, and it just didn't make sense for my mom to be doing all that work mm -hmm. while fasting herself. I mean, that's like the secret of all this, all these beautiful Jewish traditions is the mom slaving away to make them happen, right? Um, I'll, I'll digress for a moment. There's a, a, a really beautiful academic book by a woman, ah, Saba Sumach is her name. I think she's at UCLA. It's called From the Shabbos to Los Angeles, Three Generations of Iranian Jewish Women. And she did exactly that. She interviewed hundreds of women from, I, I would say, basically like my grandma and my mom and my generation in Los Angeles, Iranian Jewish. And one of the things that I learned from that, like reading that book, it's really interesting, but like one of the specific things was... Um, uh, like, you know, in, in olden times in Iran and probably now as well, uh, the men, the, the patriarchs of the family, their way of expressing their religiosity was learning the prayers and going to service and doing, knowing all those things and reading Torah and whatever. Or, uh, and the way that the, the, the matriarchs, their way of expressing their religiosity was keeping the family and keeping the home and keeping the traditions and all of that. It was like on the same level. And when you think of it that way, it really makes sense um, that it was taken so seriously. And it is like incredibly valuable that they were and are doing that. And I don't think it's at all specific to Iranian Jews. I mean, it's moms everywhere. But um, it's what keeps everything going and it is exhausting, right? <laughs> so if we can give my mom a break and have bagels for dinner, everyone wins. I think that's so lovely. Um, you're very caring daughters. I hope my kids <laughs> She does a lot. Day. I mean, this is one small, small reprieve that we're giving right. her. Um, there's a couple of there's a couple of questions that have come in. Um, um, Judy, this is a really cute question, so I'm going to throw this one to Tanaz. All right, suggestions for how else to use the pomegranate that's sitting in my fridge, other than sprinkling it on a salad. I mean, my um, vote's always for a cocktail, personally, but I'll let Tanaz answer. Definitely a cocktail. We just eat it. Like, do you just eat pomegranate? I think it's delicious. Um, one thing that you can do that is strange and lovely, I don't know how many pomegranates, if you have whole pomegranates, a thing, first of all, Iranians love pomegranates. It is like an evocative food. It is deep in our hearts. Oh yeah, things are happening over there, guys. I think it's really working. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, so we feel very close to them and so close that one thing that you can do, it's a very like personal relationship between you and the pomegranate, but you take a pomegranate and you roll it against the counter until it's like the juices, like the little seeds have broken and the juices are kind of flowing freely in there. You really give it a workout and then you quickly and carefully, you can bite off a piece of the um, peel, stick, stick your mouth on it and then suck out the juices. <laughs> it's called a blambu, and it's a wonderful way to like enjoy a pomegranate. It's just like so sensory and doesn't leave a mess. And I don't know, it's delicious. I love pomegranate juice a lot. So I say you try it. I think you could also add it to some fruit salad, you know? For sure, always. Yogurt, baba ganoush, put some, some on top of some eggplant mm -hmm. salad. Um, um, yeah, Janet wants to know, could you put the name of the book that you mentioned in the chat? Um, so she can look it up. Um, can I, let's, I don't know. Yeah. I, I will, but not right yeah. now. Get, let, <laughs> give, her, give, her, give her a minute. Um, Sarah wants to know where would you suggest is the best place to buy quince? This in Los Angeles or everywhere. I mean, I, you can, you can say Los Angeles. I mean, like, I think it, this is really a question about like where you live and what, what your supermarket carries. That's the real question. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll say like in LA, we have a bounty of, um, oh, the pressure is a lot. I don't know. Huh? But the, the thing is up, the little, the little, uh, notifier thing is up. So I think it is, I hear what you're saying. I don't know. Um, yeah. You want to check? The um yeah, I think it's doing its thing. The there are a lot of Middle Eastern markets in LA. On the west side, there is a like a Jewish kosher market called Elat Market that's like very well known. Um, on the east side, I do most of my shopping at Super King, which is like a, a local chain that is like Middle Eastern. It's Persian. It's Latino. It's Russian, but it like covers all of your bases. Yeah, I I it sounds. I think we're okay. Um, I would, um, I would say like, if you have a Whole Foods near you, I would add, no, like, you can always food. try that. There's um, also, um, there's a mail order company called persianbasket.com. You can't get the fresh stuff, but I bet you could get like the plums and things like that. You can order the mail order. I get like beautiful slivered pistachios from them because you can't find the, those ones like out in the world. Um, yeah. Um, somebody's asking if I garnish with slivered almonds. We usually don't. You can. I, I think that picture was one that we got from the internet, but yeah. Uh, what else? Someone was asking about the other simanim. Do you want me to go into that a little bit while we wait for this to... Yeah, happen? absolutely. So um, the, the funny thing about the simanim is there are like, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 of them. And the full third have to do with smiting your enemies. <laughs> um, some of them are like blessings for the new year and other things, but there's a lot of focus on enemies, which I've always found very interesting, but um, pomegranate is one of them. Black eyed peas, I think that different, different cultures do different legumes, but we do black eyed peas and they are delicious. Um, one of the things that you're supposed to eat is meat from the head of the animal so that you can be as the head in the coming year. The rush and not the shush or uh, not the not the tail shushes ones, um, and so we have cow's tongue. Not my favorite, but my mom usually cooks the cow's tongue and black eyed peas together. Um, what else? Uh, fried zucchini, or squash, which we usually do fried zucchini. Um, shush is lungs. You're supposed to have the meat like lung meat, and the idea is that um, that your problems will be light in the coming year, like the meat of like the lungs, because you know, they're kind of like that like airy texture. We obviously do not have that, but like one of my aunts in substitute uses popcorn because like it has that same like light airy texture. So, you know, you can do that. What am I missing? Beets, that's like another like blood of enemies, I think. Um, there's one, there's a, I think they might be garlic chives. It's like a green that in Persian is called tate. It's like a long kind of bladed green. Um, and you're supposed to take a bite out of it and rip up the pieces so that 
your enemies may be torn into pieces. I don't do that one. I am, I am a conscientious objector against that sentiment. Um, I think leaks apples, are one, right? Pardon? Leaks. Did you mention that one? Oh, I think that's the, we're talking about the same yeah. thing. It's like, I think sometimes they call them Persian leaks. Sometimes they call them, I think it might be garlic scapes, but um, it's not like the big fat leaks. It's a very, it's almost like a oh. long blade of grass. Um, which is what we have. Uh, and then, oh, that's interesting. Other, other people do leaks. Yeah, we do kind of. Dates, not scallions. It's something totally different from all of these. Um, and then apples and honey, of course. It's not chives either. It's different. I'm telling you, it's different. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's all of them. Yeah, I like the removal of adversaries better than them being torn into <laughs> pieces. I'm good with that. Um, yeah. Lemongrass. Lemongrass, really? Not in, no. not in Persian food. Oh, Jane says fresh quince is on the Persian basket site. Oh, Yay. awesome. It's not ramps either. I mean, you could try it. I, I like this game of like guessing the the um <laughs> the allium but it's none of these it's it's a, if it's anything that we know in english it's garlic steaks but i'm not sure it's even that yes that allium it's a good it's a good new show <laughs> um to be unsealed not venting uh we're doing the best we can with the pressure cooker i think we're okay but we'll see we'll see how well it takes through see this is why i got rid of the instant pot because I thought it was so complicated to figure out, but yeah. I like I like my good old fashioned crock pot for now. I, I um, oh yeah, I've heard of people having fish. Uh, we don't do it. I think it might be in the same slot as like the, I don't know if it's like in the same slot as the lungs or if it's in the same spot as the head meat. Like I've heard of fish. I think it's the head meat. Yeah. I think the fish is related to the same concept of being the head of the year. Right. Um, I, I feel like it also might, it's like a fertility maybe thing also, like for abundance. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, um, I've, I've heard of the squash thing. I, Syrians make um, like a candied squash um, also as one of the simonium. Um, oh. Um, my cousin's wife is in the chat and she's telling us that they do both fish and tongue, combining both our Iranian background and her family's Ashkenazi background. I love it. Um, all right. I don't know how we're doing on time. How are we doing on time? Yes, um, yes a minute and a half. A minute and a half. So we have a minute and a half before we'll open this thing and see if it actually pressure cooked, if we have anything going here. Um, so at, at 10 after, we'll, we'll check it out and see if we can start plating. So if there's um, any other questions, now's a good time. Let me type in the, the title of the book. It is, it's like an academic book. So I don't know if it'll be readily available, but it's called From the Jaws to Los Angeles. And it's by Saba Nah. There you go. Okay, let's reset up our camera here. So I think you just unpressured it, right? I didn't mean to. No, I think that's good. I mean, we had a minute to go anyway. So now we can open it up. And Friends and fish. Actually sealed it. We're all learning together. Um, I think that's sealed now, but I'm not sure because we can continue pressing the leaves if you want. I think so. I, I think we want to open it in a minute. Um, modifying it for lamb, you can absolutely do that. Use lamb shank. Everything else is pretty much the same. Uh, Someone was asking earlier about, they've never heard of beef, sh the cut of beef shank. What, what, I don't what, know about another, I don't know about another name for it. I think is it on a bone, is it on a bone, Tanas? I think it's the leg meat, but I don't know. Oh, hey, that's our timer. I don't know about another name for it. I, we've been okay with that at the, um, at the butcher shop. So. Okay. But I saw somebody else mention stew meat. You could do it. It's, it's not going to be as lovely and tender, but it works. You, you, I would always suggest, you know, if you have a butcher you go to, or even if you're going to a supermarket with a butcher, 
you know, they're very knowledgeable. If you ask them, you know, about a specific cap, oftentimes they can get it for you, or, you know, maybe they use a different name for it, but a, a, a good butcher will know and be able to get it for you. Um, and you, and having a good butcher is very important in life. Indeed, indeed. Okay, so do we so I think it's pressured right now and the the lid's canceled. Yeah, exactly. And then we have to hit the steam button and then I think it's it's gonna count down, I think, in terms of it takes a minute. It takes a while for it to be pressed, so you get an open lid. Really? Okay. So now I'm gonna try to be careful. I think. Remove that. No, no, no. Okay. 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 You try to open it. Now it's turned off. So I'm gonna leave. Okay. Thanks for going on this journey with us, Ben. We should it should this turn, right? Yeah. No. Did I? There look, looked like there was a couple of instant pot experts in the group. So yeah. Any tips on opening this guy up? <laughs> Like it's safety feature. Down. It does seem to be depressurizing. It says, okay. as a safety feature, it won't open. Don't open the button has to drop in that instant pot it's until there's no more steam and the button drops. Okay. So, what I can do in the meantime I'll just hold this. is, I'm gonna, yeah, get in there. Let <laughs> me actually grab a plate. Oh, I've got one for you right uh, on. I'm gonna do a, uh, let's see if we can. Some, here we go. Out of here. Okay, because I did so I didn't do a demo of rice for you guys, but um, I wanted to like kind of show you what the finished dish looks like. You know what? I also forgot to add cinnamon. When you guys make this, add a dash of cinnamon. <laughs> um, but let's see how we're doing here. Here we go. It's opening now. Okay. Oh, and it's opening. Yeah. Okay. We'll go there first. Then. You know, if you need extra hey, hands for rice. Let's see what we've got. You know, guys, it looks pretty good. I think that let's give it a stir. Let's see what we've got. So that quince really stays intact. It doesn't disintegrate. It does stay intact. I think, and it does feel pretty soft. I might like what I would do at this point, because it does seem like kind of piece of meat in here. The meat is, I'll just put this here. I think it can cook longer. The meat is still pretty tough. I would give it, I know that like in a regular pressure cooker, um, a 20, 20 minutes will do, but I feel like we could probably give it another five or 10 minutes. We'll plate it just to show you guys what it all looks like. Yeah, but yeah, please. Check it out. And then the, and it also is kind of watery. So I might give it a few minutes without the lid on just to let it all thicken up a little. I, I would posit that this is not quite there yet. Um, but let's make the plate and see what we get. I've made some rice. So. You, would add, you would add the cinnamon at the same time as the turmeric? I actually, um, we add it when we add in all the liquids. And I, I asked my mom about that. And I was like, well, why don't you just like cook it in with the spices? But I feel like it's more to season the stew and not to season the meat. I, that's the only reasoning that I can think of to maybe keep it like brighter and less like you're not, it's not stewing the whole time. So like, I mean, I guess it's still stewing the whole time, but yeah, you cook it, you add it in with like all the liquids. Okay. Uh, Paula suggests you can put the cinnamon now. Excellent suggestion. Yeah, most definitely. Especially because it's not fully cooked yet. Uh, all right, let's bring this over and see if we can. This is like a little extra some hands. experimental. I just need some space. Um, so 
So I don't know. If Myrna shares know. that instant pots have less pressure than an actual pressure cooker. I believe it. I think it takes time to ramp up too. I think that's all of these things are true. Yeah. Jess is also saying like it takes yeah. time for it to ramp up. I think that's right. So Sarah had asked this before and, and I, I had maybe incorrectly answered. So forgive me if I spoke out of turn. Um, do you add three cups of water to that or, or is it just the pomegranate juice? Three cups of water. Yeah. I, I didn't put it in the list of ingredients because it's just water, but I did, I do believe I added it to the um, instructions. Instructions, okay. Um, I, will, I will add that to the uh, ingredients so it's clear. Somebody um, as we're plating, I can talk a little bit about Persian rice. If you guys have not experienced it, it is truly something to behold. We use long grain basmati rice. Um, you know what, why don't I put this here so you guys can see what's going on. Um, long grain basmati rice. We have like a complex set of steps to cook it wherein you first wash your rice four times or three times or whatever. You soak it in salt water for some hours to, to prevent it from getting mushy. And then you parboil it very quickly just to elongate the grains. You can see, I don't know if you can see, but they're extremely long, beautiful individual grains of rice. And then you put part of it, you mix with saffron. Um, you put some oil and some water at the bottom of the pot. You put that saffrony rice at the bottom. You add the rest of the rice on top, and then you steam it for an hour, and the bottom cooks into this amazing kind of crust called tadig. This is the first time that I have made Persian rice without a nonstick pot. So once again, we'll see if it works. Um, I am not confident that it's going to. No, it's totally sticking. But let's see what we can get here. You can get an idea, even if you just get like little crispies like that and not the whole thing coming out. It's, here, let me show you guys. It's so delicious. It's so like crunchy. It's the part of the rice that, um, you know, the siblings fight over. You got to eat it first off of your plate. Otherwise your little brother will snag it off of your plate. Um, so yeah, we, we've got some crispies here. I will say that like, Kind of like yoga, Persian rice is a practice. Like every time you get a little better at it, you get to know it. And so when I'm home, I know my pots, I know which brand of rice to use. Although this is my rice, I brought it from Los Angeles, but yeah, these pots are not the pots I know, but I'd still eat this, it looks delicious. Um, and then to continue plating out. And I can also tell you as far as like serving is concerned, one thing that Iranians love to do is um, Sabzi, something called sabzi, where you have a plate of fresh herbs, it could be basil, mint, scallions, radishes, tarragon is one of my favorites, um, that is on the table and you kind of take bites along with your food. So if you are serving this, look into that. Where's my other spoon? I'll just use this one. There it is. Got it mixed up. And then, yeah, when you come to serve, you put some of the meats, you put some pieces of these nice chunks of quince. And then again, once this is like cooked further, oh, and you have your plums. Once it's cooked further, the liquid will be a lot more, um, a lot thicker. Let's do something more sturdy. And so when you spin it on top, it'll almost be like a saucier consistency. Um, but yeah, that my friends is pretty much the dish. You also, I'll, I'll, I'll point out that if you get those plums, the aluba khala, they do have pits. So tread carefully around that. Mm. These juices. And they're meant to, you're meant to eat them with the meat. You just have to watch out for the pits. Correct. I, I mean, they're delicious. You can eat them plain, like out of, out of hand and they're super delicious. My utensils here. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the dish, friends. I think we got it. Let me show it to you guys. This it's is really our... beautiful. Yeah. Um, that's, that's this is so great. I've really, really enjoyed hearing about the dish and so much of your stories and commentary. Um, we have a few minutes left, so I want to make sure that if there's other questions that people have, now's the time to do it. Um, even if it was asked earlier, it's okay. You can repeat it now, as long as it's not, can you make the dish with turkey legs, chicken, tofu, <laughs> anything else? 
Shannon is cracking down. And I'm mean mommy. <laughs> Sorry. Everyone's too shy now. No one's asking any questions. <laughs> Good chance. Pomegranate molasses. Yeah, you can definitely do it with pomegranate molasses. Just to adjust, add more water. It'll be so good. That sounds delicious. From Azerbaijan. Wow, I'm, I'm so jealous with the Azerbaijan. We're all coming over to your house to have flesh to bed with Azerbaijani pomegranate molasses. 